right, so our event tonight is an Ali at MSU community event. It also ties into our One Book Belgrade series again. Um, this is a community read based around a novel. This year's novel is A Shadow in Moscow by Catherine Ray. This event series is sponsored by Martel Construction. We design these events so that if you're participating in One Book Belgrade, uh, it'll deepen your reading of the novel. And if you're not reading along with us, you'll still very much enjoy the presentation. If you decide to read the novel, and here's a copy that I have, um, we have 60 copies rotating around in our uh, collection for you to check out, but they have been all checked out at the same time, so you might have to put a hold on it. Um, it's been very popular this year, which makes me very happy. <laughs> so this novel is based around female spies in Russia during the Cold War, and I thought we'd bring that topic closer to home. So I asked Rachel Phillips of the Gallatin History Museum to talk about local women and the roles they play during wartime. And if any of you here tonight uh, have stories of how you or your family aided in the war efforts, uh, I invite you to share your story at the end of the presentation. Rachel is the museum's research coordinator and spends a lot of time in the museum archives. Being such a great sport that she is, she agreed to help out uh, and put this talk together for us tonight. So please give Rachel a welcoming hand. Liz, for having me, and oh, I thought about that. <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming. I know it's not the best weather tonight, although it's a lot better than it was a week ago. So um, it's great to have such a good turnout. Um, as Liz said, I am. I do a lot of things at the Gallatin History Museum, but I guess my official title would be research coordinator or research director. So um, I've been there about 15 years. I started um, doing digitizing of the photo collection um, when I first started and have since branched out into all kinds of things. So uh, we have a quarterly magazine that we print that um, we like to feature stories of local families and events. Uh, we're always looking for articles for that. So if you're interested in uh, sharing your family story with us for publish publication in our magazine, um, I have some cards. If you have any questions at all, I'm happy to give you one of my cards with my contact information afterward. Um, I also brought, which I put on the table over there, some brochures from the museum and a little bit about uh, membership in the museum. Uh, we're a nonprofit located next to the courthouse on Main Street in the old county jail building. So if you haven't been there before, I highly recommend you come visit us. It's a lot of fun. It's bigger than you think from looking at the front. Um, we have a whole bunch of jail-related exhibits, some crime stories in there, and then lots and lots of Gallatin County photographs and history stories that we're always adding to in a very active research library that um, people from all over come and look into their family history or look at the history of their property. Um, so we're always adding stories to that. Uh, so again, if you have any stories you'd like to share to it with our library, I'm very interested in, in adding some of those. And then it, when I'm done tonight, if any of you have stories of your own family members um, at wartime. I'd love to hear those. We can take some time to share those if anyone has any. So, um, since I like stories so much, I tried to gather as many interesting stories or tidbits or observations from local women. Um, and there are so many more that I haven't run across yet or haven't been shared with me, um, but I gathered up a few here to share with you tonight. I also really like the historic photographs, so I tried to get uh, quite a few of those, too, of some local women that uh, participated in wartime activities, where they, whether they were um, on the home front or uh, overseas. So, I like I uh, came across this poem in the uh, Weekly Courier newspaper a few years ago, and I thought it was a great way to start this topic. Um, 
So it was written by a local woman named Florence Sheridan Spaulding. Um, and if anyone in the back can't read it, it says, My hubby left his overalls a hanging in the hall. He looked grand in his olive drab. He's big and strong and tall. They looked so lonesome and forlorn, hung there beneath the shelf. One bright spring day, I took them down and put them on myself. <laughs> um, the picture you see here, Thelma McNall, um, doesn't have anything to do with the poem. I, I chose it because of her attire. I uh, thought it went really well with the, the poem. But I tried to do a little research on Thelma just to, to see what um, her story was. And I didn't uh, ran out of time to find out too much, although it's, it looks like she grew up on a farm uh, in the Leverich Canyon area, so southeast of Bozeman and eventually became a teacher. I wasn't able to find out yet if she participated at all. I mean, I'm sure she did on the home front, but whether she was involved further in, um, in wartime activity, but I thought that was a great photo. Um, Florence, the woman who wrote the poem, uh, was born in Bozeman, um, and her both of her brothers served in I think the um, Spanish-American War and World War I. And she was seemed to be quite a poet. I've come across several of her poems in the newspaper, a lot of them related to wartime. Um, and this, of course, this poem was published right in the middle of World War I, or toward the end of the war, I guess you could say, after the US's um, involvement. Um, so, there were, of course, lots of ways that women helped out with the war effort. Um, I started out with featuring a few um, examples of people who assisted on the home front. Um, one, a lot of, unfortunately, uh, a lot of what I found, or maybe fortunately, I, I didn't find a whole lot of stories related to much past World War II. So I mostly focus in this presentation on, on people that participated in World War I and World War II. And I didn't, unfortunately, I wish I could have found spy stories to go along with your book. Maybe someday I'll come across something that relates to a local person. But um, so far, most of what I'll talk about today relates to the World Wars. Um, and oftentimes, the women in this area on the home front, all kinds of other ways, and I'll touch on a few of these that you see up here. So Red Cross was a big one um, on the home front. Um, you had people, uh, a lot of men left either for the war or to work in other areas related to war time production. And so you had a lot of job openings, so women went to work in fields they normally didn't, of course. Um, you had a lot of activity to support the, the war efforts through Montana State College at the time. And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, Gold Star mothers that were in this area, which is just another means of support that um, women provided. Um, but I'll start with the Red Cross. Ooh, that picture is kind of washed out. I should have... Uh, enhanced a little bit. Anyway, the picture on the right is an interior shot of the Red Cross surgical dressing room, which was a room that the local women used to roll bandages, things like that, which was located on West Babcock in Bozeman, um, near where, uh, I'm trying to think of where this, what's right in that area now. Um, uh, just west of Tracy, the intersection with Tracy and Babcock. And that building is still there. You can't see it very well from that photo, but um, we have some other pictures at the museum. Can, look can at. I ask you, is it the red brick building on the corner on Babcock next to the Presbyterian Church? Is it that building? It's it's on the north side of Babcock. On the north side. Yeah, so it's it's a one story building. Um, I think there's a 
realty office on the portion of it that faces Tracy. Um, but according to newspaper accounts, um, the local women in Gallatin County were pretty early in forming a Red Cross chapter when World War I broke out. Um, so actually they formed, their chapter started forming before war was even declared um, by the United States. Um, and by mid-April of um, that year, they had over a thousand members and started raising money and um, supplies to send overseas. And then, of course, the United States um, was only in the war for about a year, and then um, the war was over. But the women. Um, met in this room. They had uniforms, kind of like what you see Hilda wearing on the other side. Um, they would meet roll bandages, sew, sew um, items that needed to be sewn, knitted things to send overseas to the, the troops. Um, I, we have another oral history interview with um, Violet Lilly, who grew up in Three Forks. Um, and she talks about her mother, Grace Collins, who took a test, apparently, with the Red Cross to um, get certified in teaching other women on how to <coughs> roll bandages and uh, put together things like that. So you had uh, intensive training in the Red Cross also to go along with the uniforms. Um, we have another oral history by someone else in Three Forks, Vera Wilcox. Um, she grew up there. She worked, uh, or work, her father worked for the railroad. And she was like Nellie, a young teenager when World War I broke out. And so I'll read a little bit about what she had to say about her mother's and her experience with the Red Cross a little bit in Three Forks. Um, I was about 12 years old, and we had radios, and we, um, if we wanted to find out anything about what was going on over there, we had to get it out of the daily paper. My mother had cousins in that war who were all overseas, and I know we just could just hardly wait until we could get to town to buy a paper. Each day they listed the casualty list, and from all over the United States, and especially from this area. Each day there was always a big page, and my mother would bake food and send it to these cousins of hers. I didn't know how to knit, and we didn't have any program where the kids were allowed to fold bandages or anything. Although they did have a Red Cross chapter in Three Forks, I wasn't a part of it. It was a sad, sorrowful time, and I can remember going to the shows and seeing the ladies sitting there watching the movie in the big sweaters. I've often wondered how many dropped stitches there were. There were bound to be some. Um, and she is right about the, the casualty list. Uh, we have other pictures of this uh, Red Cross surgical dressing room where they had boards on other walls with names. Um, so they, they kept track of uh, the people from this area that were serving. The woman on the left, Hilda May Huffman, um, she helped out with the Red Cross during World War I. She was born in the late 1880s in Iowa and married a local man named George Huffman in 1907. They had a daughter named Esther. Uh, unfortunately, George was, he was working for the Milwaukee Railroad as a brakeman and was killed in 1918, right in the middle of World War I when he fell from the rear of a train in Belgrade. So she was left to care for her daughter on her own. She eventually moved out of the area and remarried, but um, that's a good example of what those Red Cross uniforms used to look like. So women also picked up jobs around the area that were vacated or that needed, they needed extra help. And a great example of this is the Bozeman Canning Company, or the Pea Cannery. I mean, there's lots of examples of women going, joining the workforce. 
Um, but the, this is an interior picture of the Bozeman Canning Company. So um, if any of you have been to the cannery district on the northeast side of Bozeman, there's a big water tower there and some old buildings, lots of businesses now. Um, so that is the old pea cannery, they called it. Um, Bozeman was a big, well, Gallatin County area was a big producer of seed peas, and then the, the pea cannery developed a few years after that. But um, there were, they, about 1911, some people from the east decided that this was a great place to uh, grow peas and then collect the seeds and then ship them off to, to other places in the nation um, to supply seeds for pea growing. Um, and then a few years after that, they decided, well, if we're growing all these peas here, we should start a cannery. So between those two, that employed a lot of women. You see here, they're um, sorting peas. Um, usually what happened was the, in the winter time, the seed pea companies would employ a lot of women um, that would sit by conveyor belts. I'll see it. She'll show you another picture in a minute. Um, where they would pick out insects or uh, damaged peas or little bits of debris. Um, and then in the summer, during the when the local farmers were harvesting their pea crops, they would. Uh, the pea cannery would be really active and they'd bring in peas uh, and have to can them all that same day. So there were pretty long hours at that time. Um, and government contracts in both World War I and World War II um, gave lots of women opportunity for employment at the pea cannery because they were requesting the government wanted all of these canned peas to send over to uh, troops overseas, so it, it really employed a lot of people in, um, at that time, especially women. I have a, there's another picture of the, the outside of the, one of the Bozeman Canning Company buildings a little bit later. Um, I have a, this is a reminiscence from a man, actually, but uh, he has some, a great description of what it was like to work in the pea cannery and sort of a little summary of what their operations were. Uh, he spent, his name is John Nelson, and he started working at the pea cannery at age 16 in 1942. Um, and he wrote in 1995 a, an article called Life in the Pea Cannery. So he talks a little bit about women working there as well. So I'll read you what he has to say. Selective service draft calls were heavy that summer, he means 1942, as World War II intensified. High paying war industry jobs in the Pacific Northwest lured many. As the pea canning season gained momentum, high school students and housewives became the backbone of the cannery labor force along with a sprinkling of retirees migrant workers and not yet drafted and draft ineligible, um, as well as hobos. The 1940s process for getting peas out of field and into cans started with mowing and collecting the vines, peas, pods, and all. The severed vines were transferred to a viner which separated the peas from almost everything else. 40 pound boxes of peas were trucked to the cannery. The canning process began with a clear water wash followed by grading, which is separation by size, steaming, and visual inspection. The inspectors, housewives, and high school girls removed seeds, small debris, and damaged peas. The rema remaining peas were mixed with brine, which included water, sugar, and a pinch of salt, he said, and filled into cans, which were, which were delivered by a can shooter. Cans were lidded, crimped, then retorted, which is cooked and cooled. The hot steam from the blancher billowed upward, carrying the aroma of cooked peas everywhere. Fermenting pea process waste produced sour notes, which were anything but complimentary. My appetite for peas, a favorite vegetable, temporarily disappeared to return about two months after the cannery closed for the season. I'm not sure mine would have ever returned. Um, the cannery work schedule was totally dependent on crop conditions. 
Harvesting began about an hour after dawn when the dew had evaporated. The first trucks of vined peas arrived at the cannery about nine. About an hour later, processed peas reached the can filling equipment. Processing continued until all vined peas were in the can. Peas were never held raw overnight. Work days ranged from four hours at the beginning and end of the harvest to 20 hour days at peak season. 12 to 16 hour days were common. There was no overtime pay category. The company had two wage scales, 40 cents per hour for light or unskilled jobs, and 55 cents per hour for jobs requiring skill or heavy lifting. Um, and we also have an oral history from a woman named Della Doyle. She didn't work in the cannery, she worked in the seed pea industry, which was the part of the operation that gathered the seeds and sorted them and then packaged them and shipped them across the country. So she has a little bit to say about what that was like, similar to um, what you saw in the first picture, but uh, you see here the conveyor belts with um, women sorting, cleaning out the, the parts that shouldn't be there. And, and all the, the cans in the lower right. We have a great um, pea can at the museum that's with a label that has Bridger Canyon sweet peas on it, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> Lots of peas went through there. Do you know where they got the cans from? That's an excellent question. I don't know. They must have shipped them in from somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Della Doyle says, the first time I worked in seed peas was in 1919. The seed peas had been going for probably 10 years at that time, but they had built it up until there were places for about 500 women to work. There were five seed houses. She means there were five seed company businesses um, in Bozeman. The peas came down on a small board, and you would pick out the coals and the different kinds of seeds. Say, if Alaska peas came, they were little tiny round ones. There might be another mixture in them, and you'd have to take all of the mixture out. You'd get your bins dumped if you didn't get them all out, and you didn't get credit for them. Those were seed peas. The work kept a lot of people from going hungry in those days. And I remember in the Depression time, they would probably have 45 or 50 places for women to work, so positions open in the business. And they would hire 52. The 50 would have to give up two days a week to let the other two work. And they never um, let anyone work if their husband was also working. This was during the Depression. So they tried to um, spread out the work and pay to as many people as possible. We'd start in September picking seed peas, and we would pick them until May by hand. And I remember picking as high as 110, 120 pounds just by hand in a week's time. But when I started working there, we went to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. And we worked until 6 at night with one hour off at noon, which was a good long day. Most of them were raised in the valley. Most of them were irrigated. I don't know if they shipped some of them in from other places to be picked or not, but I know that it was a big industry at that time. Um, the pea industry in Bozeman went really strong for several decades following World War II, a uh, combination of drought, uh, disease in the, the pea crops, and the new popularity of frozen vegetables uh, kind of put the pea cannery out of business. So uh, it declined and uh, closed down in the mid-50s. So another um, great, uh, lots of women at the university were quite active in uh, the war effort at home in several different ways. So the extension service at MSU um, is an organization that gives, works with local agriculture and farmers and teaches classes um, and assists people in the area. So Bess Rowe of the Extension Department um, in the newspaper in 1917 listed 14 ways that local women could help the war effort. 
and most of those centered around cultivation, so growing their own gardens, preservation, canning food is a lot of that, and elimination of household waste. She started a volunteer program with local students, um, domestic science students, probably many of them, that would go uh, around to different households in the summer during when school was out and teach local women more efficient ways of canning food. So I found a few names of some local MSU, MSC at that time, students who helped out with um, teaching local women how to more efficient ways to can. And those were Noda Prescott of Belgrade, Helen Rose and Ida Truman of Bozeman, and Frida Hafner of Three Forks. Those are just a few that helped out with that. And that's a, a picture of canning equipment, probably about 1940s. Looks a little different than today, but you have a pressure cooker in there and glass jars, uh, which you definitely reused over and over again. Um, another part of the extension service at MSU is 4-H Club, which is geared toward younger people, of course. Um, and the extension service found that uh, teaching younger people about efficient um, food production and preservation uh, during World War I was a great way to uh, help with the war effort. So they had competitions with 4-H kids um, on growing things, and I think there were a lot of girls groups in 4-H that did canning um, competitions. and trying to find a more efficient way, experimenting with things to, to get canning practices done. So this is a float on Main Street of girls on a 4-H, and it, again, it's a little hard to read, but the sign on the side talks about um, we're doing our part to conserve and um, preserve food for, and for the, war effort and to um, limit household waste, basically. It's, they're just a, um, part of keeping the, everything going at home. So this is a picture of female students inside Hamilton Hall up at MSU, which was a girls' dormitory. And during World War I, um, and the flu epidemic, many students were ended up being quarantined um, on campus or in their homes. And they continued their education as best they could, but they also took time out to do projects like what the Red Cross did where they would knit sweaters, um, sew bandages, and, and ship them out. So that's just a, a, an example of um, I think they're, in this picture, they're having some recreation time, but um, you had groups of female students at MSU that were also heavily involved in that as well. Um, quite a few students that if they didn't um, leave school and, and go back home, they, they tried to keep them isolated. They had a dean of women, Una Herrick, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, that she tried to keep the, the girls quarantined and was pretty strict and taught them herself inside and without any classes going on at campus. So they were, the flu epidemic and coincided a little bit with World War I was pretty serious. So they, um, they also, these, a lot of these women uh, created face masks during the epidemic too, along with, um, bandages and things like that. This is a, just a fun picture of um, women that were, I don't know, I can't figure out if they were volunteers or um, it was part of a program up at MSU, but they, um, during World War II, they had civilian um, aviation training, um, and so they had these girls apparently volunteered to help serve food and prepare food for the um, 
civilian training detachment up at MSU. I just thought it was a fun picture. They found ways to have a good time. And they were probably, I'm sure, very busy with school and um, helping out with war effort. Um, so this is a, an interesting episode at MSU. I mentioned her a little bit ago, Dean Herrick. Um, she was Dean of Women at Montana State College from 1911 to 1934, and she did a lot of work advocating efficiency, I guess you could say, in college life and education. And she was a leading force behind this sugar pledge, which during World War I, everyone was trying to conserve um, different foods to send overseas, and a big one was sugar. And the Weekly Exponent, which was the college newspaper, printed an article about this in November of 1917 called College Women Will Conserve Sugar Supply. So I'll read you a little bit of what they, what they, how they described this sugar pledge. Recognizing the present shortage of sugar available to our allies in the war, we, the women of Montana State College, are glad to join the Food Administration in efforts to reduce sugar consumption in the United States, and to this end, pledge ourselves not to use more than one tablespoon of sugar a day, and not to eat more than six pieces of candy a week. From the present date, which was November 6th, until January 15th, 1918, it is agreed that these pieces shall not be larger than the equivalent of one inch square and one half inch thick. So they really got their candy size down to a science there. Um, but the, the quote from the newspaper there um, is kind of entertaining. The girls are doing their share, the boys should too. If they cut back on tobacco, beer, and liquor, we would save a lot of sugar, barley, and corn for the men at the front. And so they were encouraging the, the men to do the same thing. Um, uh, Dean Herrick viewed the U.S. involvement in World War I as an opportunity for middle-class women to get involved in um, areas outside the home, I guess you could say, and um, be responsible citizens. Um, the female students that were involved in this sugar pledge apparently took some teasing, but um, they... Uh, took advantage of their growing sense of power, I guess you could say. Um, Gold Star Mothers, I'll just mention a couple. So Gold Star Mothers, that um, is still going on today, that started in World War I, um, with lots of women who had lost sons and daughters in the service. So the goal was for these mothers to get together, um, comfort each other, and also assist returning veterans, especially those in hospitals. It was officially organized, this program, in 1928, although it started in World War I. Um, and it got its name from the service banners that were displayed in a lot of windows in homes. So people, if they had a, a son or daughter in the military, would put a banner in their window with, a, I think, a, usually a blue star. Um, and then if the son or daughter was killed, it would be replaced with a gold star. So that's how they got their name. Um, the woman on the left is Lizzie Benz Enders. Um, she was one of the first gold star mothers in Gallatin County. And I've done a little bit of research on her lately with assistance of um, some family, a family member of hers. She had a really hard life. Um, she, her mother was actually murdered pretty brutally in 1889 um, on a, their homestead south of Bozeman, which was located near where Fowler Lane meets 19th, near where you turn to go up to highlight. Um, and Lizzie ended up having to raise her two younger siblings. She was about 18 at that time. She married and had two children. Henry, who was drafted into the army in World War I, he left 
the area for training in September of 1918 and went to Fort Snelling, Minnesota. And only a month after he left home, he got the flu. And they notified Lizzie and her husband, Fred, who immediately went back there and he just he lived only a few days. So he passed away, they brought him back here. That's why she's a, one of the first gold star mothers. He, he died in training of the flu in Minnesota. Um, and then, just a few months later, their daughter Selma, who had a young child herself, um, their daughter Selma also passed away of the flu. And so Lizzie ended up, Lizzie and Fred, her husband, ended up raising their grandson. Um, who eventually took over their farm. Um, but that's a picture I got from her, one of her descendants that gave me quite a bit of information about both her mother's murder and um, Lizzie's later life. Apparently she was quite an amazing lady who um, did what she had to do to take care of neighbors who were ill. Um, I was always running the farm, um, feeding all the farmhands. Um, she eventually stayed on the farm working until her, for several years after her husband passed away and when she moved into Bozeman. Um, she, she died in um, 1946. Um, her great granddaughter, um, Liz Dunn uh, wrote that although my great-grandmother died when I was a small child and I cannot remember her, I love her as if she were alive. So apparently she was a pretty amazing lady and went through a lot of hardships. Another gold star mother was Alice Dahl. The Dahl family, you probably recognize that name. They were, she, well, Alice and her husband, um, Emil, came to the area in about 1917 and eventually, no, she married Emil in 1917. They didn't come to the Gallatin Valley until the 30s when they purchased a mortuary, which still goes on today. Um, Alice had nurses training um, and they had several children. Eldon Dahl joined the Army Air Corps in 1942 and flew missions over Europe and North Africa. His B-17 was shot down over Italy, and he was missing in action and captured, spent three months in a prisoner of war camp before escaping and making his way back to um, the Allies. Their son Charles Raymond also enlisted in the Army Air Corps and served as a bombardier and nose gunner in a B-24 over Europe. His plane was shot down in 1944 and he was killed in action. So she um, was a gold star mother because of him. Um, her, their son John Bernard Dahl listed, enlisted in the US Navy, eventually became an officer there. Their daughter Mary graduated from Montana State College in 1943 and studied dietetics at Stanford and joined the Army Medical Corps in 1944. She served on Guam and Iwo Jima, overseeing meals, food prep, um, for the soldiers that were stationed there. She recounted some of her experiences of daily life um, in a book called Women of the Home Front World War II, Recollections of 55 Americans which I didn't get any excerpts of that today, but uh, she had some interesting experiences from her time in the military. Um, and their daughter, Vera Dahl, became a nurse and trained nurses' aides during the war. So their children were very involved um, in World War II. And Alice, pictured here, herself was involved in the Red Cross, the USO, and selling Liberty Bonds. And she, because of her and her children's service received the honor of christening a victory ship in 1944. So victory ships were designed as sh supply ships um, that could uh, hopefully outrun and withstand attacks from German U-boats. And there were apparently victory ships named for historical towns in every state in the nation. And so 
The SS Bozeman victory, she was chosen to christen that ship. She was from Bozeman. And so here she is doing that in 1944. Um, she says that I was treated royally at the christening of the SS Bozeman, was presented with corsages, flowers, and gifts. There were 60 Bozeman relatives and friends at the lovely luncheon given by the shipyard. I visited um, at Barnes General Hospital, Vancouver, where I gave my flowers to eight Montana boys who had come back from overseas service. The SS Bozeman victory wasn't in service for very long, um, about 106 days. It appears to have been uh, later sold for, to a private party in 1946 and probably scrapped at that point. So it didn't, it didn't um, last very long. Alice passed away in 1986, and there's a today a nursing scholarship in her name at MSU. So now we'll switch to some women who served in the military different ways. One of the mo most interesting was the Hello Girls, who were an elite group of women who had um, training and particular talent in telephone operator skills and oftentimes knew French very well. They looked for women who were fluent in French and preferably also could have experience telephone operating. Um, when the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, they realized in France that everything had been destroyed. There was all kinds of... Communication was horrible. They had to put up um, telephone lines as quick as they could so that they could communicate with um, across the battlefield and to the, um, the commanding areas behind the front lines. So they installed a bunch of telephone poles, and because so many men were enlisted to fight, they decided to recruit women to serve as telephone operators in France. And they were called the Hello Girls. This is a, not a picture of Hello Girls, but <laughs> it's a great picture of telephone operators about that time in, in I believe it's probably Manhattan. Um, but some local names there. But these women uh, were trained in, for example, if they knew French really well but didn't have experience telephone operating, they'd get training in that area or vice versa. And they would send them overseas to um, handle communications between the battlefield and the um, commanding officers. There were a few local women that served as Hello Girls. One of them was Lena Roy. I don't have pictures of these women, unfortunately, but Lena was a clerk at the Wilson Company department store in Bozeman. That was a long time department store downtown. Um, she was of French descent, so she spoke French very well. Um, Merle Egan was another one. She was the chief operator for Mountain State's Telephone and Telegraph Company and served as a telephone operator following the end of the war, actually, at the Versailles Peace Conference. So she, she stayed around in Europe for quite a while um, and operated telephones. So a bunch of women also served in the Navy. There were different parts of Navy service that they could serve in. One of them was what they called yeoman, which was a mostly clerical positions that they needed to fill since they had the, the men doing the, um, had to, they needed more people to fill different positions. Um, so that included stenographers, radio and telephone operators. Some of them even served as mechanics and truck drivers. Um, and this is a great picture, again, having lots of fun, it looks like. Um, June Metcalf Crawford is in the front row, right in the middle. She was a local gal, and we'll talk about a little bit about her later, but this is her class at training school in New York. One of the yeomen, naval yeomen in, um, from Gallatin County, uh, was a gal by the name of Catherine Cock, and I, again, I don't have a photo of her, but she was born in 1883 in Kentucky. 
uh, came to Bozeman and lived with some of her brothers, it looks like, and worked as a stenographer. She eventually got her own homestead near Miles City and started uh, proving up on that when World War I broke out, so she enlisted in the Navy. It doesn't appear that she ever went overseas, um, but she had it all arranged with her neighbors um, to take care of her crops in her homestead while she was gone. But she lived in Bozeman for quite a few years. Um, eventually married in the early 20s, uh, lived in Glendive the rest of her life, uh, and passed away there in 1991 at age 107. I wish I had a photo of her, but I, I don't. Um, here's another picture of June from the previous shot. So she was in the Navy, a uh, member of the WAVES, which were, stands for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. And the WAVES were established, like I said earlier, as um, to fill the needed clerical positions in the Navy. So many of them worked in healthcare or stocking supplies. Um, a few even worked as code breakers. Many of them served actually in the United States, but a few of them did go overseas. So June here was born in Wyoming in 1924 and moved to the Gallatin Valley with her family as a child. And she joined the waves and was stationed in Washington State, so she never actually went overseas, although she did serve with the Navy um, from 1944 to 1946. Um, this is another local gal who served with the Navy in the waves, Helen Fector, which um, some of you may remember her, if you've been around here for a while. She was born in 1910, grew up in Bozeman, got a bachelor's degree in secretarial science from the college. And during World War II, she spent four years as an administrative assistant um, serving in the United States, but it was during her time in the military that she discovered her talent and love of photography. So she ended up taking a whole bunch of pictures that ended up in naval records. Um, and then she went on to, after the war, um, in town, she helped start the Bozeman Camera Club. So she was, we have some great photographs she took at the museum. Um, she also was one of the founders of the Gallatin History Museum, or the Gallatin Historical Society in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, she worked as assistant registrar and then later as registrar at, at Montana State for about 20 years. She retired in 1970. But she was a little bit interesting. She was of German descent, so she had some interesting observations about what it was like growing up in the Gallatin Valley during the um, German hysteria, which was more in World War I, I think, than World War II, according to her. Um, but she wrote some interesting essays on that subject. Um, one of them is called An Alien in Her Native Land. And I'll read you a little bit about what she wrote. Uh, the years 1917 and 1918 have had a lasting effect on my life. Yeah. She declared war on Germany in 1917. German hysteria was high. In Montana, the Montana Council of Defense harassed slackers and other citizens who were thought to have contributed too little to patriotic subscriptions like the Red Cross and Liberty Bonds. Hundreds of Montanans were dragged before public assemblies and forced to demonstrate their patriotism by kissing the flag and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. German books were gathered up and burned any reference to Germany or pictures were snipped out of all textbooks. All German songs and words were banned, as well as music by German composers. German flags and dictionaries were blotted out, and some went so far as to spell Germany without a capital letter. Sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage. Hamburger became Liberty Steak. German measles became Liberty Measles. And a Mennonite minister was almost lynched because of his pacifist views. I had to undergo all kinds of name calling by the other kids, like a little hun, and the kids chanted at me, your father is German. 
I was in the second and third grades, and we were frantically knitting 10 by 10 inch cotton washcloths for our soldiers at the front. Our teacher taught us to knit, and all the washcloths usually ended up at 8 by 12 or even 6 by 13. We were very proud of our war efforts to help the American soldiers. My father came from Germany, and my mother's father was Swiss, so we were targets for much of the harassment. It didn't frighten me because I knew that I was probably more pro-American than many of my Irish and English friends. Wasn't I knitting more washcloths than they were? <laughs> Those who physically abused me got more than they gave. Um, she also went on to talk about her experience uh, enlisting in the Navy um, in 1943. I was asked what I would like to do. They promise you the moon if you will enlist. I said I would like to work in some form of communications, radio station, decoding, etc. After graduation from officer candidate school, I didn't get my orders until the day after graduation. Everybody else had gone. I thought they had forgotten me. The orders, when they came, were for teaching in a yeoman school in Iowa. I asked about the communication promise and they showed me the first page of my personnel file that had first generation American stamped across it which apparently meant that I was not to be trusted. Um, she also, interestingly, worked at the pea cannery. So I'll read you a little bit about, since we talked about the pea cannery, what she had to say about that. Um, when I was 16, I was old enough to work at the pea cannery for 30 cents an hour, $2.40 a day. We picked foreign material from the shelled peas as they came by on a moving belt, $2.40 a day is less than today's hourly wage, but it helped pay for clothes, books, and spending money. Um, Helen talked a little bit about recycling. She was a great writer. She wrote a lot of her memories and experiences down, which we had at the museum. Um, but she listed a few things that they recycled um, before, well, between World War I and World War II and before. Um, Milk bottles were used over and over again. The family dog or cat ate or buried most of the food scraps. Nobody bought cat or dog food, although I occasionally bought a can of salmon for the dog or lamb kidneys for the cat. Outgrown clothing was handed down or made over. No man-made fibers, all silk, cotton, linen, or wool, eventually made into good cleaning rags or quilt pieces. No plastic trays, tubs, or wraps for meat or bakery items. All were wrapped in paper, which was burned in the kitchen range. Newspapers were used for starting fires from scratch. Most fruit and vegetables were home canned in glass jars, which were reused. Few cans to throw away. Human hair was saved and used in handicrafts. Toys were better made and repairable, lasted a long time, sometimes through several generations. No junk mail to dispose of. I liked that one. Magazines passed through many hands then, along with Montgomery Ward and Sears catalogs, were relegated to the house in the back. Mothers washed diapers, there were no pampers. Broken furniture repaired, not thrown out. So those are her, for a few of her observations on basically recycling. And then I'll, I'll end with a little bit about this gal who served in the Army, Pearl Cry. She was born in Holland, Michigan in 1909. Her father actually died a week after she was born. Um, and her mother eventually moved her and her older sister to the Gallatin Valley where she was gonna keep house for a local farmer. Her mother ended up marrying again and they, she grew up on a farm uh, west of Bozeman. And she early on developed an interest in nursing. And so during the war, she remembered um, working in local hospitals and seeing a lot of car accident victims, um, things like that. But she eventually joined the Army Nurses Corps. And in an oral history interview, she was asked how she got started in nursing, which I thought was an interesting story. Um, she said, I think when my mother was in the hospital, I went to visit her several times and I admired the girl who took care of her. And I thought I'd love to be like her. The first tourniquet I ever tried to put on was on a horse. 
Dad had a beautiful bald-faced mare. I just thought she was the most beautiful horse we had. He came in the house one day. He was really upset because the horse had gotten tangled up in some barbed wire. And this was wire with sharp barbs on it. The horse really cut her leg and it was bleeding profusely. Dad came in the house and said, well, we're going to lose Macy. I can't stop the bleeding. I said to him, are you sure you got it all tight enough? And he said, well, I'd like to see how it could get any tighter. I said, well, would you mind if I tried? And I can remember one of my kid brothers taking along to the barn saying, just what do you think you're going to do? <laughs> and on my way to the barn, I grabbed a stick. So when I got to the barn, oh, I could tell it was just bleeding terrible. So I loosened up dad's bandage, stuck my stick in and twisted it, and it stopped bleeding. I imagine it sealed itself over because the horse lived. So Pearl went on to have a long career as a nurse and eventually retired from the Army in um, 1970, I believe. Um, so she's a good one to, to end up with. And that's uh, most of what I have, but I'd love to hear stories from you if you want to share any. And I have, like I said, business cards here if you'd like to contact me about anything, uh, any questions related to the museum or research. And we have brochures about the museum on the table. So. There are lots of those. Yeah. I didn't happen to I'm sure there was some from this area. Um. Ashley, whose family lived here in Belgrade, they uh, she did the pink banner and she did all those things. Mm -hmm. She was on, on the telephone mm -hmm. operator of business too. She's just amazing how she did all the things that you mentioned here. I think a lot of them did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the women's efforts in the right to vote? Um, I bet that definitely didn't hurt it. Um, Montana was interesting in that uh, women's suffrage here was quite a bit ahead of national women's suffrage. So women in Montana got the right to vote in 1914, and I believe it was 1920 before the, the national law went into effect. Um, so I imagine, um, I mean, 1914 was a little bit before World War I started, but that same time period, so, um, of course, you had Jeanette Rankin, the, the first female member of Congress that voted against both wars, so I'm sure that, I'm sure that did help a lot with advancing women's rights and suffrage. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, where I grew up, we had a corn cannery. Did you? And it just, you didn't ever want to buy a can of corn after that. <laughs> 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 you saw what went into that corn. <laughs> yes. The peas were the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think frozen vegetables are a lot better. Back mm -hmm. <laughs> As a teenager, I spent for a good time. In a pea canner. Did you? Yeah, working for that 50 cents an hour. <laughs> and uh, on this tray that, that were the conveyors that would go by, and the ladies would be picking out mostly is the little buds of Canada thistle. Have you ever You all know Canadian thistle and that little bud? And it looks just like a pea. So they were pretty busy picking those little pea buds. <laughs> so every time I see a Canada thistle, I think about the pea. <laughs> That would have been a tedious job, especially at those 20-hour things. Anyone else have a story or a memory or a question or anything? Well, thank you so much for coming.